in Christianity, you have to believe Jesus is God to go to heaven. In Islam, if you believe Jesus is God, you're going to hell. Simple as that. They can't be more diametrically opposed. But when I studied the evidence, when I studied the history, and I'm talking about through a historical lens, not reading the Bible and saying, well, the Bible says it, therefore it's true. Not at all. I didn't trust the Bible. I'm reading the Bible the way a historian reads ancient texts, and I came to the conclusion Jesus did die on the cross, and he did. The best explanation by far of what happened to him is that he rose from the dead, and that he also claimed to be God. Uh, by the way, yeah, amen. Well, my mom, when she came to the U.S., no American, definitely no Christian, ever received her into, into their home. To this day, no Christian has invited my mom into her home. No one in her community has ever reached out and invited her. They see the burqa, and all of a sudden they get afraid. And so my mom has not had the opportunity to see what real Christian life is like. Instead, what she's told is that America is a Christian nation. Then she looks at the TV and sees all the crazy stuff happening on Hollywood and all the stuff happening in celebrities' lives, and she hears what's happening in the news and the murders and the rapes and all this and that, and she says, this is a Christian nation. This is what Christianity is all about. And so she wants to train me as a young Muslim, not just to be a good Muslim, but to also not get affected by Christianity. And so from a very young age, she would teach me how to respond to Christianity. She gave me books to read to say, this is why Christianity is false. You know, what sense does it make to say that a man died on a cross for your sins? How does that even work? What sense does it make to say that God is three in one? What sense does it make to say uh, that the Bible is reliable when we've seen all these issues with it? I was reading these books from childhood. And so when people were coming to me, and it very rarely happened, but when people came to me to share the gospel with me, I was trained with a response to give to them so that they would be turned around. And so I would share Islam with whoever would listen. The first time I encountered a Christian who actually was prepared with answers to these kinds of questions was in college. Um, his, his name was David. I met him on a debate tournament. I had joined the debate team, he had joined the debate team, and we were going for our first tournament. And so we ended up, we had to split uh, share rooms anyway, so we ended up rooming together that night. And as I'm putting my stuff away, he pulls out a Bible and starts reading. I'm thinking, no way, this guy's a Christian, this will be fun. <laughs> and so I looked at him and I said, David, you realize that book you're reading is not trustworthy. And he closes the Bible and says, go on. <laughs> it's like, David, think about it. Didn't Jesus speak Aramaic? But the earliest New Testament was written in Greek. And so by the time you actually have a recording of what Jesus said, it's already gone through a translation. But the Bible that lasted the longest period of time in church history was the Latin Bible. And so it goes through another translation. And then from Latin, it went to German before it came to English. So you had another translation of a translation. So you've got a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation is what you're reading. How do I know that I'm actually reading Jesus' words when it's been translated so many times? David says, Nabil... Earlier today, I heard you speaking on the phone with your mom. Were you speaking in English? I said, no. And he said, but then I asked you what you talked about with your mom, and you told me in English. Was that a bad translation? <laughs> no. He said, Nabil, you're multilingual. You can take what you hear in one language and accurately translate that message into another language, and so were the disciples. Whatever language Jesus was speaking, yes, he spoke Aramaic, but he could have been speaking Greek. Whatever language he was speaking, the disciples heard it, wrote it down in Greek, and we have in our possession today over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in the original Greek. Nabil, we know with certainty what Jesus said. I said, David? I think you're making this up. <laughs> I've talked to hundreds of Christians. No one's told me this before. He says, you think I'm making this up? I'm like, yeah, I think you're making this up. He says, well, bring it. I said, it's been brought. Let's go. 
And so for the rest of the night, I just challenge him argument after argument. I'm like, what, what do you mean Jesus died for the sins of mankind? How does one man's death pay for everybody's sins? What do you mean that God is a trinity? How can three be one? What do you mean? And I would just challenge him on all these basic principles of Christianity. And for the first time, someone had thought about it and was actually giving me responses that began to make sense. Although I wasn't done challenging. It's not like I just believed him the moment he gave me a response. So I challenged. We pushed and pulled. He started pu- pushing on Islam a bit, and I started pushing back. And so we're going back and forth. By the end of the weekend, we're nowhere near done with arguing. So we decide to go back to our university and sign up for courses so that we can sit in the back of the lecture hall and argue with one another. In the course of all this, going to each other's house, living life together, we actually became best friends. I realized that David was my best friend. And if you have a message like the gospel and you're sharing that with a Muslim, you're basically asking them to give up their lives. You're asking them to give up everything. If they don't know they can trust you, they're not going to hear what you have to say. Relationships are critical for sharing the gospel. I'm not saying street preaching doesn't work. It does work. I do it. But that's not the primary mode God has intended for us to reach the world. It's through love and relationships. And so my friend David after sharing arguments with me over the course of a year, it actually took a year to discuss the reliability of the New Testament, I began to conclude, hey, this book is actually reliable. There's, there's no way that the New Testament, because of the way it was written and proliferated, there's no way anybody could have come and intentionally altered it such that it wouldn't have been caught. I wish I had time to go into the details, but there, there, is, there was no method of external control over the scripture like that. It proliferated much more organically. And so I said, okay, the New Testament's reliable, but does that mean Christianity's true? No, it doesn't. How do I know whether Christianity is actually true or not? And so for the next few years, we embarked on an investigation into the evidence of Christianity versus the evidence of Islam. In Christianity, you have to believe Jesus is God to go to heaven. In Islam, if you believe Jesus is God, you're going to hell. Simple as that. They can't be more diametrically opposed. But when I studied the evidence, when I studied the history, and I'm talking about through a historical lens, not reading the Bible and saying, well, the Bible says it, therefore it's true. Not at all. I didn't trust the Bible. I'm reading the Bible the way a historian reads ancient texts, and I came to the conclusion Jesus did die on the cross, and he did. The best explanation by far of what happened to him is that he rose from the dead and that he also claimed to be God. Uh, By the way, yeah, amen. And I looked at the case for Islam, and, you know, here's the thing that I want to get across to you. We were told stories about Muhammad growing up, about how amazing he is, about how gracious he is, about how merciful he is, about how he's the best general, the best statesman, the best diplomat, the best father, the best husband. We were told all these stories, and that's why we had this love and passion for Islam. In the West, at least, that was our impetus for loving our faith and for saying Islam is a religion of peace. But... When I started investigating the evidence, instead of just listening to stories, I said, what does history say? And I went to the earliest books written about Muhammad's life. And when you read those books, you find horrific things that you've never been told before. The stuff that ISIS knows, the stuff that Al-Qaeda knows, the Taliban, they know this stuff. We weren't taught this in the West. And I'm studying the evidence and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, is this my prophet? And so all of a sudden, I had to deal with the cognitive dissonance of what is all this? And the evidence, the argumentation that I thought existed for Islam all crumbled at the, at the moment of investigation. And the more I studied the case for Christianity, the more and more solid it became. And so now I'm dealing with a real dilemma. Instead of just arguing with my friend, now it's about my soul. Now it's about my life and about the world. And so I ask God, God, can you show me what's true? I've done as much as my mind can do. I need you to show me what's true. And Muslims often ask for guidance from God through visions and dreams, particularly dreams. And I did ask God for guidance through visions and dreams, and he gave me a vision in three dreams. Well, they led me to the cross, but they also led me to scripture, and I began to want to read what the Bible actually said. Here was the context in which that happened. I was driving to school. It was my my first day of second year of medical school, so it was perhaps the most difficult academic year of my life. And I'm, instead of thinking, okay, this is, I need to gear up for school. I just can't get my mind out of the fact that, wow, 
everything I ever believed might be false. Everything my parents stood for might be false. This Christian message, as crazy as it sounds, might be true. Um, and, and so I can't get my mind out of that. And I'm just literally crying as I'm going to school. And I say, God, I know what I need to do. You've given me all the evidence. You've given me all the spiritual guidance through visions and dreams. I know what I need to do, but I need time to mourn. I need time to mourn. Because for a Muslim to give up their Islamic life is to give up everything. My mom had built her whole reputation, her whole life's value was in serving the mosque and in preaching Islam. She's the daughter and granddaughter of missionaries. And in an honor and shame culture, for your son to become a Christian, your only son to become a Christian is worse than if, if he had died. And so, can I do that to my mom? It's not just a matter of me, right? I know my reputation is going to go down the tubes, but forget that. My mom and my dad, who've done nothing but sacrificed everything they had for me, can I do this to them? And so, you're wrestling with all this, and I was just crying, and I, I, said, I said, forget it, I'm not going to school. I went back to my apartment, and I put the Bible and the Quran in front of me, and I said, God, I need your comfort. And so I opened the Quran, and I started looking for verses of comfort. And for the first time, I realized that there is not a single verse in the Quran designed to comfort a hurting man. Now, there's verses that say, if you repent, God will forgive you and stuff like that. But nothing that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <laughs> nothing that reaches the heart. And so, I put the Quran away. I said, this book doesn't apply to my life. And I opened up the Bible. And I said, I don't know where to turn. Uh, I know Christians read the New Testament, so I'll go to Matthew chapter 1. Saw it was a bunch of genealogies, so I skipped it. I was a Muslim. I had an excuse. Skipped it. Didn't take me long to get to Matthew chapter 5, and this is what it says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I thought, this is exactly what I just prayed. God put this verse in here for me. I mean, you guys can read it if you want, but it's my verse. <laughs> and I was like, this is amazing. And as I read it, it was like it was electric, and it jumped off the page and kick-started my heart. And I was like, who is this God? And I read the next verse. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And I'm thinking, I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm not righteous. Every time I try to be righteous, I fall, I sin. But you're telling me just that I hunger and thirst for righteousness means I'm blessed? What kind of God is this? And they start reading through the scripture, not trying to tear it down as I always had, but actually to receive what it had to say. I encountered an unconditionally loving father. And I thought, this is amazing. And I didn't want to miss a thing, so I was reading every single footnote. And I would ask God a question. I'd be like, God, how do I know you're even hearing me right now? And I'd read the footnote. If you want to know God can hear you, <laughs> go to 1 John 3. Thanks. Boom. 1 John 3. And I start reading, and I'm going back and forth every single footnote. It takes me a while to get from Matthew 5 to Matthew 10. But when I finally get to Matthew 10, this is what I find. He who proclaims me before the people of this world, I will proclaim before my Father in heaven. And he who denies me before the people of this world, I will deny before my Father in heaven. You see, I had all the evidence. The evidence was solid. I had the spiritual guidance, dreams and visions. I had the emotional guidance. But I had not proclaimed because I knew it would cost me my family. But as if God knew what I was thinking, the next verses say this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And I was thinking, okay, God, I get it. If I really love my parents, I will proclaim you to them because you are the truth. But it's not just my parents. It's my entire life, the whole Islamic community, all my friends, everything that I've planned, it's all going to go. You know what the next verse is say? He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, crazy convicting. So I bowed my knee and I prayed. Well, no one had told me about a sinner's prayer. I've been with David for four years. No one told me about a sinner's prayer. Uh, but I prayed. I gave my life to Christ in that moment. And um, even though I assented in that moment to the gospel, I think I actually understood it a few days later when I had seen my father cry for the first time in my life. 
when he found out what had happened, he said these words to me, Nabil, today I feel as if my backbone has been ripped out from inside me. You have to understand, my dad is like this pillar of strength in my mind. He's the warrior. He goes out and fights for the country. I'm the guy who made him cry. And my mom, if you had met her up until that moment, she had always been full of life, gregarious, hospitable, welcoming people in, feeding them. There was always a light shining in her eyes. And in that moment, it was as if I reached into her soul and turned that light off. And she has never been the same. And when they left, I just crumbled to the ground. And I just started crying. And I'm saying to God, why didn't you kill me? Because I'm thinking in my mind, if you'd killed me the moment I believed, I would have been in heaven. I'd have been happy. My parents wouldn't have known. They'd have been happy. I'd be worshiping you. You'd be happy. We'd all be happy if you'd killed me the moment I believed. And so I'm rocking back and forth and saying, why didn't you kill me? Why didn't you kill me? And I don't know where your theology stands. I'm just here to testify to what happened in my life. As I'm saying, why didn't you kill me? Why didn't you kill me? I heard these words, because this is not about you. And it was like I was rooted to the ground. I could not move for 10 minutes. I was stuck in place. And when I finally did get up and I walked away, it was as if the person who had been there crying was somebody else. And it was as if all the issues I had were somebody else's issues. And I walked outside and I looked at the world and it all looked so different. And I looked at a person crossing the street It's a fairly mundane thing, someone crossing the street. But for the first time, it hit me that that's not just someone. That person is worth so much, God died for them. Now, you have to understand, in the Muslim perspective, God doesn't come into this world. This world's too filthy. God doesn't die for anyone. Why would God do that? They're his servants. He's God. He's created the universe. He's majestic. Why would he do any? He would never do any of that. And the answer is, he would because he loves them that much. They're worth that much to him. And the creator of the universe, the one who's worshipped by angels for all eternity, if you just saw one of those angels, you'd be tempted to worship it. That's how magnificent they are. They're all worshipping him. And he comes into this world for us, to die for us. I know there is a God who watches over us, who's made a way for us, and this life will be over in the blink of an eye. I don't care who you are. If you get killed by a car walking out of here now, or if you die when you're 100 years old, it will have been the blink of an eye. And then our real life will start. Do you know where you will be when your real life starts? And do you know the God who can infuse real life into this life?